Kaliya, and then he told him, just leave. He could have killed him, but you know what saved him? His wives. It's good to have a good wife. <laughs> Without wife, there's no life. It's only strife. And sometimes you wind up getting the knife. No, that's an, okay. <laughs> that, that's something else. You see, this is not my fault. <laughs> I'm only doing this because I'm in the presence of Chandra, and he always does rhyme. And so, because of when I see him, I just can't help it. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologize for that. <laughs> it's your fault. Okay. Anyway, so we can learn something from rhyme <laughs> if it's in time and it's not out of chime. <laughs> okay, so there is Kaliya, and then we can go on. Now, these next two demons are very, very interesting. And this is Denokasura and Palumbasura. Now these two fall in the category, within the category of demons that are separate. And what are, what's about them is they were killed by Balaram. Who is Dainokasura? Dainokasura, according to Garga Samhita, was the son of Bali Maharaj named Sahasika. He offended Durasa Muni by disturbing him when the Muni was meditating by making a lot of noise while he was enjoying with 10,000 women on Mount Gadamadana. Durvasa Muni cursed him to become an ass, saying, fool, ass-like person, become an ass. Oh, demon, <laughs> after 400,000 years in the transcendental circle of Mathura, in the sacred forest of Talavan, you will tame liberation by Lord Balaram's hand. So here's the point. Why Balaram? Why not Krishna? He could not be killed by Krishna. Why? Because Krishna had given his word to Prahlad Maharaj that I will not kill any of your family members. So Prahlad Maharaj was born in a family of demons and his son was Virochan and Virochan's son was Bali. So Bali also had a daughter, no, he had a daughter, yes, and he also had a son. And that son was the one that was causing disturbance and he became a demon called Danuk. So what does Danuk represent? Why is he unique? What is it about his type of, um, his type of bad qualities that is unique? And Prabhupada says, and the Acharyas confirm that, Prabhupada, the Acharyas say, and Prabhupada confirms this, that these two demons represent certain anarthas that the devotee has to make a very personal and constant endeavor to rid themselves of these anarthas. In other words, by instructions of the spiritual master, and who is the spiritual master? The spiritual master is a representative of Balaram. Balaram is considered the original spiritual master, and all spiritual masters that come in the line of spiritual masters are an energy of Balaram. They're the energy of Balaram. So therefore, by the mercy of Balaram coming through the disciplic succession, one should execute devotional service in such a way that one hears from the spiritual master how to rid oneself of these particular anarthas. And what does Dainukasura represent? He represents ignorance of knowledge of the soul through gross material intelligence and a jackass foolishness. He also represents total ignorance of one's identity, foolish misconceptions about the eternal nature of the holy name, thinking the holy name is just a nice chant or a series of letters put together that if you just say it fast enough, somehow you raise your bile and your 
and your, and your body, and you feel a little dizzy when you do that, and therefore you're in that's ecstasy, it's all material. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati says, some chant the holy name and all they're doing is raising the bile. <laughs> it's not about chanting. So the point is to see the material, the holy name in a materialistic way, and that's one of the offenses to the holy name, to consider the glories of chanting Hare Krishna as imagination or to give some material interpretations of the Holy Name. So, Denukasura represents that ignorance. He also represents the misdirection in one's life on, on what is worshipable. Like, God is worshipable, yes, but then there's also other people who are in this material world who are also worshipable. Or even demigods. Sometimes we say the demigods are great devotees of the Lord. Are they worshipable? They're honorable. They're not worshipable. We don't worship the demigods. Worship is meant for Krishna. Bhajay. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that one should not worship the demigods, but one may offer respects to the demigods because of their position in power and also because they are great devotees. But worship is meant for the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his pure devotee. That's where worship is directed. Hmm. So sometimes people worship everything. They worship their TV, their computer. Om Namo Computer Ki Jai. <laughs> and then they push the button and things happen. Wow, just see, my puja was successful. <laughs> and then it crashes and then they try a new puja. <laughs> No, we don't worship anything material or anything quasi-spiritual. Only worship is for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, verse number 47, which is the last verse in that, ver in that chapter, Krishna. Prabhupada explains in detail. So, Dainukasura is the ass, doesn't know where to... See, he worships Kamsa. <laughs> He's worshiping Kamsa. So, the story of Danuk. Danuk is interesting. Uh, I'll proceed to tell the story if you have a little patience. I'll try to do my best to give the story some, what we say, authority based on the scriptures. Krishna plays with his friends, and he has many friends. How many cowherd boys? Who? Wow, billions. There are billions of cows. How do they fit into the land of Vrindavan when it's only 32 miles square? That's if you see it in a material way. The, the Dom is not measured by miles or feet or any kind of material measurements. It is transcendental. So Krishna has unlimited cowherd boys and some of his favorite friends. He has many friends and some of the more intimate friends. They came to Krishna and they said, oh, Krishna, do you know there's a nice, nice forest? It's called Talavan, and there's so many beautiful trees, and there's such fresh fruits there. And those fruits are the best fruits anywhere. We can just smell the aroma. Krishna, Balaram, we want those fruits. But there's a demon. His name is Danuk. He's not letting anybody into his forest. And if you go there, it's dangerous. But I know you guys can do it because I, we saw you kill some other demon. How do you kill demons? You must have special mantras. The, the, the cowherd boys can't figure out how Krishna does it. They see it and then they think, hmm, maybe it's his mother that gives him some power. <laughs> but I'll tell that story later, how Krishna reveals how he kills demons. It's a very special secret. If you know this, then you can also kill demons, but don't do it. <laughs> okay. Because devotees don't kill anything. So, and then Krishna and Balaram are there, and they want to satisfy the cowherd boys. So, 
cowherd boy said, let's go. We can smell the aroma of those sweet fruits and we're becoming hungrier and hungry. Oh, our bellies are aching. Please get these fruits for us. Sounds like they got material desires, doesn't it? But they don't. They want to play with Krishna and, and enjoy because the spiritual world is enjoyment. It's only enjoyment. There's no work there. You don't go to work. For those of you who are attached to work, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just not a place to go if, you're, if you really want to punch in from nine to five every day. You don't punch in, you punch in and you stay in. <laughs> It's just joy. It says that all, all talking is singing, all walking is dancing, and the constant sound is Krishna's flute. When I was in New Vrindavan, we would go up to the, the old Vrindavan farm, we'd carry, go through this forest-like maze, and there was one tree and on that tree, it had that sign, Sri Vrindavan Dham, where all talking is singing, all walking is dancing, and the constant sound is, of the, is the flute, Krishna's flute. So I would see that sign all the time. So that's the spiritual world. It's simply joyful, that's all. And so, Krishna and Balaram come. So Balaram's there and he starts shaking the trees and some of the fruits are falling and he picks up the fruit and he starts eating it. And then he's just enjoying. And then all of a sudden, Danuk starts to realize somebody's in my forest and he's eating the fruits. This is not right. So he gets angry and he sees this person eating a fruit. So he runs. And he runs as fast as he can. He's running. Boom! And he kicks Balaram in the chest. And Balaram feels it like a little breeze, you know, and just keeps eating the fruit. Something happened, I think. <laughs> so, and then, but Danuk, he, he's not finished yet. So he takes his aim again and he comes running again, this time with a greater speed and a harder kick. <laughs> And Balaram says, all right, that's it. He's ruining my lunch here. <laughs> so he grabs Danuk and goes, grabs him by the hind leg and goes, <laughs> throws him up into the tree. And he, while he was spinning around, he lost his life. And when he hit the tree, the tree fell over and hit another tree, and that knocked another tree down, and all the fruits came down. All the cowherd boys said, Jai, we don't have to climb the trees. The fruits are falling down. So they just gathering the fruits. And Danuk was dead. Haribo. Devotees like that, right? No? Haribo, that's all you get. Come on. Haribo. Haribo. Oh, glory is to Balaram. And so, and then Danuk, you know, he's a leader. He's got a pack of asses. So they come, their leader has been destroyed. So they line up and they come charging at Balaram. And Krishna thought, hey, why should Balaram have all the fun? So he jumps in. <laughs> and so the demons are charging and then you're grabbing them and they're swirling them around and throwing them up in the trees. And Prabhupada describes in that particular narration that it was a panoramic sight because each of the ass was a different color. So it looked like a rainbow in the trees, all these different asses. It was ass-like trees or tree-like asses, something like that. <laughs> so it was just... And then, of course, then all the fruits fell to the ground and all the devotees... The, the, Krishna was enjoying the fruits and all of cowherd boys enjoying the fruit and Danuk was dead. Haribo. <laughs> okay, so working hard for material sense gratification is an ass. When I was in New Vrindavan, we had, an, we had a couple asses. 
You don't see too many in Chicago. We see different kinds of asses in Chicago, but we won't, we won't get into that. But uh, we had some asses in, in, in New Vrindavan, and they were in a little area by themselves. You know how, you know how asses have sex life? Would you like to hear the sex life of an ass? Sounds like a very interesting topic. You don't have to Google this. I'll give you the, I'll tell you exactly how it works. <laughs> you, you can really learn all about sex life from asses. It just shows you what not to do. <laughs> okay. So the male, he sees, oh, there she is, the beautiful, my beautiful wife. Oh. Uh. For a donkey, another donkey looks good, right? <laughs> right? But if for... Sometimes we also wonder, we see two people in the material world and you look at them, what are they seeing each other? Huh? <laughs> but that happens, of course, you know, because love is blind. <laughs> Not blind, it's perpetually blind. <laughs> It's like a dark cave where you can't see anything. <laughs> anyway, so I hope you're not going to report me to the GBC for this class. Because <laughs> I, I plan to give another class after this. So <laughs> Anyway, this um, donkey, he comes, he sees his beautiful wife. And he, she, he gets closer to his wife, and he's all prepared. And she sees him, and she says, oh, here he comes. <laughs> and she just turns around, and with all her force, she kicks him in the face. Boom! And he just falls back and says, love. <laughs> and then he, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not deterred. He's still determined. So he comes back again, and she gives him part two. Boom! Punches him again in the face with her hind legs. And then he thinks, hmm, what's happening here? Maybe I should try again. <laughs> so the third or fourth time, he's successful. So that's, that's S like sex life, just in case you want to find out what it's like. Sometimes it's similar to the material world. <laughs> You just get kicked, but anyway, that's what it's all about, getting kicked. <clears throat> so, these are, this is a, a donkey is a fool. He's called nature's Mack truck. <laughs> he carries big loads and doesn't know why he does it. He works hard. And you see, you don't see it in India. You see it in India a lot, but you don't see it here that the washer man or a person who has a donkey, he loads big, big, big loads on the back of this donkey. And then to get the donkey moving, because the donkey's lazy, he doesn't want to do things, but he, he gets a little grass and puts it in front of the donkey's face. And so the donkey says, hmm, man, Prashad. And so, so, the donkey's moving closer to the grass, but the washer man, he's moving forward. So the donkey's moving forward and the grass is moving forward. And he never gets it. So he get that way, the, don the washerman gets his load carried. Now, the, if the donkey was a little bit intelligent, he would understand there's grass all over. <laughs> but he can't see that. <laughs> so he works hard for material sense gratification. So this is rec rec uh, this is Dainokasura, simply working hard, simply to get sense gratification. So we have a tendency. Devotional service is not about working hard. Devotional service is about directing your consciousness to Krishna with devotion. The work we do is necessary in order to facilitate certain arrangements where we can perform devotional service. But we don't work hard. Right? Prabhupada was there one day, Prabhupada was saying, Krishna consciousness, simply chanting, dancing, and feasting. That's all. 
And one devotee said, but Prabhupada, we got work to do. No work. There's no work. <laughs> Simply chanting, dancing, and feasting. Prabhupada, you, but, uh, there's no work. <laughs> Prabhupada was insistent, there's no work. So when we do what we call service, if we have the mentality that it's difficult, arduous, imposition, then it becomes work. But service is always chanting, dancing, and feasting. In other words, it's joyful. Even the service we do, whether it's cleaning the floor, organizing programs, or whatever we do, it's an expression of our desire to serve Krishna. Therefore, it doesn't fall into the category of work. It's actually transcendental. So sometimes we have to struggle a little bit, but that struggle shouldn't take us away from that mood because even if we have to ex, when we say do a little bit of what we call endeavor, it shouldn't be beyond a certain point which causes us to forget Krishna or forget the goal. Therefore, that's called prayasa. Prayasa means unnecessary over endeavoring for material things. So one as devotional service is easy, material life is difficult. <laughs> so if we take the Krishna consciousness, we find it becomes very natural to chant, to dance, to take prasadam, to read books, to worship the deity, to do all these things for the pleasure of the Lord and for the service of the other Vaishnavas. It's actually a wonderful process. But because our minds are still trying to enjoy what we do, Therefore, it becomes like work. When we try to get some happiness from what we do, and then we try to squeeze out something, then it becomes work. When we simply do it as an offering to Krishna and his devotees, then that is devotional service. Even if it looks like work, it's not work. So, Dainuk represents Ignorance of the soul, working hard for material sense gratification, a jackass, foolishness, not knowing. So Balaram, he's the spiritual master. He teaches us how to destroy that through the instructions of the spiritual master. So one has to work in such a way or think in such a way how to get rid of this Dainuk mentality. How to, how to get gain from fruit of activities. That's Dainuk. Devotional service, fruit of activities are in the mode of passion. Passion means I'm simply trying to get something on the personal level for what I do. You will get something. It's automatic. You'll get pleasure. You'll get knowledge. You'll get freedom from material suffering. That's automatic. But you don't, the mentality is that we're simply trying to do it for the, for the Lord, that's so, all, or for the Lord's devotee. With that consciousness in mind, everything becomes wonderful, that's so. all. And the easiest things become even easier, and the hardest things become natural. It says, there's one verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita which says that simply by remembering Lord Chaitanya, Difficult things become easy to perform, and one who forgets Lord Chaitanya, even the easiest things become difficult. Mm -hmm. So as soon as one remembers the Lord, or prays to the Lord, somehow a whole new consciousness comes, and then we see the activity in a different way. It's an opportunity to purify our hearts, an opportunity to show our love for Krishna. So this is, and the leaders in the temple should propagate that mood that it's not work. It is simply your chance to purify your heart for, for the offering, to offer your love to Krishna. And then it becomes wonderful. 
even if it's difficult. And then difficult things become opportunities to test our ability and our intelligence so we can offer more to Krishna. In other words, challenges, devotees like challenges, right? I mean, just to sit in this class is a challenge. Huh? <laughs> So I guess you're, that answered the question anyway. Yeah, so devotees like challenges, right? They say challenges bring out your good qualities. Or they bring out qualities you didn't even know you had. Like that. So but that's why Prabhupada used to say, do something wonderful for Krishna. And just see. Have you read the book, uh, Chasing Rhinos with the Swami? Have you seen that book yet by Shamsundar? It's just been released this year. Shamsundar writes about the history of Krishna consciousness when he first met Prabhupada, even before then, and how the movement developed. And it was just one challenge after another. But he writes it in such a way, and he's also feeling that way, that they li the devotees liked challenges when Prabhupada would give them something difficult. Go to London and open up a temple, meet the Beatles and get, it, and get everything going and I'll come. <laughs> and And six devotees, three householder couples with some borrowed money who landed in Luxembourg and from Luxembourg they had to get to London and then in London, they had to go through immigrations and show that they had some finances, and they only had enough finances for one couple. So they would, they went in with fifteen hundred dollars, showed it to the immigrations, got in, and wired the money to the next couple so they could come in, and then they wired it to the. That's how they got in. Yeah, isn't that correct, Vishaka? Yeah. Oh, seven, yeah, little Saraswati, a three-month-old baby. Malati was nursing her child. The baby was born in June. They, were, they went to, they went to uh, London in the end of August, the beginning of September. Just a three-month-year-old baby. Still, and you know what babies do. You know. <laughs> they do a couple of things, but... You know, so it's not easy to maintain a child at that and at the same time travel to a foreign country with no money, no context, no place of residence, nothing. But they said, we're going to do it. And look, the whole the London Yatra opened up because of that. Amazing. It's really amazing. You have to read this book. That's one of the many, what we say, adventures that the devotees took on to spread Krishna consciousness. And that's what spread Krishna consciousness, that adventurous spirit. Let's do something for Prabhupada. Let's open up something. Let's try this. Let's distribute this book. Let's do this. 19-year-old Shivananda, by himself, Prabhupada said, go to Germany and open up a center. Young boy, 19 years old, just joined the movement a year before. Prabhupada sent him to Germany by himself. And he opened up the German Yatra. All by himself. And Shama Sundar was having a little trouble getting a temple. And, and Shivananda went at the same time to Germany. And Prabhupada wrote a letter to Shama Sundar and saying, Shivananda has opened up a temple in Germany, but I don't see any temple in London yet. <laughs> So that pushed them to work a little bit harder and they finally got something. But so this is this was what Krishna consciousness was like. The idea of trying to maybe do a little extra and just see the mercy, how Krishna empowers the devotee to do something. Don't get comfortable. Getting comfortable means what? What does comfortable mean? It means means you can't really do much. Even if we have enthusiasm when we have to take care of our families or go to work like that, that same enthusiasm should be for spreading Krishna consciousness. 
think how you can spread Krishna conscious. Krishna will empower you. Not only empower you, he'll show you how to do it also. So that was that was the way the movement spread in those days. Still is. The adventurous spirit is still here. Uh, okay. So Dana Kasura, any questions about Dana Kasura and what he represents? And then I'll speak a little bit about Palumbasura, the other demon, working hard for material sense gratification. Okay, so Palumbasura. Palumbasura, Krishna likes to play games. And every day the cowherd boys get together and they also play different kinds of games. Actually, it's mentioned that every game that any other, any child played in this world was played by Krishna in the spiritual world. <laughs> Everything starts from there. What is Palumbasura? Palumbasura represents lust for the opposite sex, desire for profit, adoration, and distinction. Fame, pratishta, puja, wanting to be worshipped, wanting to be uh, popular like that, materially, and lust for the opposite sex. Who was Palumbasura in his last life? According to Brahma Vivarta Purana, he was Sudarshan, one of the brothers of Suhotra, who later, who later become, became the demon called Bakasura. According to Garmavis Samhita, he was Vijaya, the son of Gandharva king named Huhu. So the, the Acharyas differ from who he is. How did he get become a demon? He was cursed by Kuvera for stealing flowers from one of his gardens. Haribol. <laughs> we do that sometimes. But we give it to Krishna, though. <laughs> Mother Rishaka, you know these flower stealing stories? We we had many of them in our Iskan movement. <laughs> I did it a few times. I didn't get cursed because I gave it to Krishna. <clears throat> okay, so Bhakti Vinod Thakur writes, lusty attraction for the opposite sex, greed for money, the desire for sense gratification, honor, false prestige. These are strong obstacles. If one endeavors in a very humble mood, Krishna will certainly show his mercy. Then, upon the awakening of the mood of Baladev, the devotee's heart becomes free and these contaminations are gone. So, one has to work, what we say, on an individual level to rid themselves of the, the attraction for the opposite sex in order to enjoy. And of course, greed for money, greed for position, greed for power. These things are palumbasura. So Krishna was playing, and then one demon, he was smart. He, uh, one cowherd boy had to stay home that day. He didn't come. His mother kept him home for some reason. So this demon disguised himself perfectly as this cowherd boy. Now nobody could see it except Krishna, not even Balaram. <laughs> Why didn't Balaram see it? Because Krishna didn't want him to see it. It's because Balaram, Krishna's mystic power is stronger than Balaram's. So he even covered Balaram. Only Krishna can do that. So, this demon, and Krishna's looking at him and says, hmm, what a funny looking cowherd boy. <laughs> He's actually a demon. I can't really, really wait to kill him. But no, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to let Balaram kill him. <laughs> so, they decided to play a team game. So they had three boys. Balaram was, had one team and Krishna had another team. And they played a game, and the losers would have to take the winners on their back and carry them around as the, you know, the penalty for losing. So Balaram's team won. 
And this demon was on Krishna's team. So Balaram had to, no. Yeah, Balaram's team won, yeah. So this demon, he took Balaram on his back to carry around. So he puts Balaram on his back and he's, Balaram thinks he's a cowherd boy. But then this demon decides, I'm going to kill this cowherd boy named Balaram. So he starts going away from the other devotees. And he starts going farther and farther. And Balaram's thinking, where is he going? <laughs> and Balaram's thinking, hmm, this is a strange cowherd boy. <laughs> and then as it was going on, this demon couldn't keep his disguise anymore. And then gradually he started to reveal his big hideous form as a monster with copper color eyes and hair like, like one of the, you know, what is it? You see the purple hair, you know, purple and green and all that, something like that, different color hair. And so he was like, running, carrying Balaram, and Balaram says, Oh no, a demon, Haribo, time to go to work. <laughs> so Balaram went <laughs> with his fist and punched him in the head. <laughs> and the demon just started to vomit blood, and then his head was split open, and he fell to the ground, dead, Haribo. Wow. <laughs> Jai Balaram. <laughs> We like when demons are killed, yes? Okay, there you go. We got one cowherd boy still going. <laughs> so, yeah. Then, you know, Balaram was surprised, but then he took proper action like that. So, Pralamba, he represents this mood of wanting to enjoy the opposite sex in a lusty way. Boy is attracted to girl, and girl is attracted to boy. Any discussion on that? Nobody, everybody agrees with that? Nobody's saying anything. Is it too early in the morning for this lecture? <laughs> Prabhupada mentions in the Krishna book that as one as a boy is attracted to a girl and a girl is attracted to a boy, that natural attraction is there. Therefore, we also have a natural attraction for Krishna. But that's on the spiritual plan. On the material platform, it's strong. And so that attraction, when that attraction takes the form of trying to fulfill one's lusts by exploiting the opposite sex for one's own selfish sense gratification, that becomes palumbasura. <laughs> that becomes palumbasura, like that. So therefore, we see this material world runs on this principle that somehow or other enjoy with the opposite sex in different ways. And lusty, the, the more lusty you are, the more, what we say, successful you are to fulfill your desires. But in spiritual life, what is lust anyway? Lust is love of God, which is directed towards the material. It's the same energy. It's called adiras. What is that adiras? We, the living entity, as a spiritual being, has an unlimited, powerful, un, what we say, unstoppable, attraction to Krishna that is that is more powerful than anything in the world as soon as we awaken a little bit of that we can taste it but when it gets fully awakened then one cannot live in this world anymore one cannot live one cannot live Lord Chaitanya someone said to Lord Chaitanya Lord Chaitanya you're such a great devotee you have so much love for Krishna Lord Chaitanya said, I have no love for Krishna. Why? I have no love for Krishna? I'm still breathing. <laughs> I'm still eating. I'm still trying to maintain this body. That shows you how, that I have no love for Krishna. 
So he was exhibiting what it means to have love for Krishna. That one cannot, one doesn't have anything to do with this body anymore completely. That's powerful. But that attraction to Krishna, which is natural and spontaneous in a loving way, when it's diverted or deterred or directed to something in this world, that's called lust. That's all. The same energy. You bring it back to Krishna, and then it take it gets its natural propensity again. It comes back to its natural state of, of beauty. So therefore, one, that's the endeavor of a devotee, to direct our attention again on Krishna and away from the things in this material world like that. We can use things in this material world, but we're not allowed to enjoy because there is no enjoyment in anything material. And sex life is the greatest illusion. It is called, it's the greatest illusion because it presents itself as the greatest form of happiness, but it's the greatest form of suffering. The most suffering comes, you, all the novels, all the movies, Romeo and Juliet, what did they do? They committed suicide at the end. <laughs> so, you know, I love you, therefore I'm going to kill you. No, something like that. The point is, this, this mood of attraction to the opposite sex to, in order to enjoy is simply a redirection of our love for Krishna, that's all. So bring that back to Krishna through chanting the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. Purifying the heart by eating Krishna Prashad. Krishna Prashadam is very powerful. It helps to reduce our tendency for material enjoyment. And associating with and serving Vaishnavas. These are the formula for again, Directing that energy back like that. More and more emphasize that thing. And when we find ourselves looking towards material life for enjoyment, check the mind. Just check the mind. The mind, the mind will go wherever it wants to go. Chanchalahi mana krishna pramiti balavadritha tasyaham nigramam maye vayor idam saduskaram Arjun speaks this verse in Bhagavad Gita and he's talking to Krishna and he's saying, my dear Krishna, you're asking me to control the mind, I think it's like controlling the wind, it's impossible. And what does Krishna say in the next verse? Abhyasena tu kuntaya vairagyana chagrihate. If you can do it, if you practice. Well, every time your mind goes through something material, bring it back to Krishna, bring it back. Don't let your mind stay there. Just bring it back to Krishna. Just think of Krishna, chant Krishna's name, remember Krishna. Somehow, by practicing that, gradually we lose our attraction for material life, which causes us mitche maya ravese ka chilha bubububai jeev krishna das e vishwash kolina dukanai. Life after life, one body karna, karna guna sangoso sarasa joni dhyanmasu. Life after life after life after life after life after life after life. I can't count the amount of lives. One body after another, sometimes a good situation. We don't belong in this world. We belong with Krishna in the spiritual world. This world has value only because it can help us get to the spiritual world. That's the value of the material world. Therefore, manaso deho geho yogichu more arpilu tu alpade nanda kishore. Bhakti Vinodha Prakori says, my wife, my home, my family, my, my possessions, my body, it's yours, Krishna. It belongs to you. You gave it to me in the first place. I'm simply using it to live in this world, but it's your property. So when you try to enjoy the property of the Lord beyond what is allotted, for your quota. Ishavasamidam sarvam yatkinchatam jagata jagatena jaktena bunjitaha magridaha kasiswidanam. Sri Upanishads in the first verse says if you take your quota, 
whatever you need to live nicely in this world, and you live in that way, then the next verse is you can aspire to live for hundreds of years. And life is happy because you're using your time for Krishna consciousness and you're not, what we say, moving yourself, trying to increase the opportunities for sense enjoyment in this material world, which are just leads to more and more suffering, that's all. So this is, this is a devotee. The devotee can associate with or be in contact with the material energy and not be affected. Why? Because they keep their consciousness on Krishna. They keep their consciousness on devotional service. Okay, so Palambasura. He represents all bad qualities. So one has to pray for and hear from the spiritual master in order to get the directions how to destroy these two demons, Palambasura and Dainukasura. And then gradually one can free themselves from these tendencies. The rest of the demons who were killed by Krishna, what is the difference? When they're killed by Krishna, the effort that we make to rid ourselves from those anarthas come by way of the process of bhakti. By following the process of bhakti itself, Krishna's mercy manifests. But in these two cases, one has to follow the process of bhakti and make an extra endeavor to rid themselves of these things, these two demons, Danuk and... But with the mercy of Balaram, and Balaram is very merciful, his, his appearance day is coming up in two days and will glorify Lord Balaram as the original spiritual master. He empowers those persons who take up the position of spiritual master with his Shakti to guide the living entities back to the lotus feet of the Lord. And Balaram is very merciful. And that mercy manifests again as Nityananda. Prajendra Nandanaye, Sachi Sutta Hoilo Se Balaram Hoilutai. That, that same Balaram is now Nityananda. And we know from hearing the pastimes, Nityananda's mercy is the supreme mercy. Even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't exhibit the mercy as much as Nityananda. The Jagais, Madais come to Krishna consciousness and get a chance to become great devotees. That's Lord Nityananda. He's very kind. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes, Chandra. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, I was wondering on your chart where it shows misconceptions, is uh, there a correlation between that and sin? Is there a connection? Because I was thinking a uh, relationship between God and fame and how both of those can be perverted in their own way and then also with pious and offenses or piety and then impiety. Well, all anarthas are interrelated in one form or another, but the chart doesn't indicate that. That's just the way the chart set up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sorry about the jokes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I had this question, Maharaj, like, uh, is there any particular time gap for those various stages that you were uh, describing yesterday? Of the nine stages of yeah, bhakti? Is there a no. The question is, is there, is there a time gap going from one stage to another? No, it, it's accelerated by your own by your own endeavor in bhakti. For some people it's slower, and some people it's faster. But Bhakti Vinoda Accord makes a nice point. He says that if you're on one stage and you don't aspire for the next stage, then you can also fall back to a lower stage. So you have to know what stage you're on and what you need to do to go to the next stage. So one has to understand how, what do I need to purify my heart? And we can see that. We can see our own, 
what we say, contaminations, or our own deviations, or our own attractions to material life, and then we work on that. Now, it's easy to understand the difference between anartha nivritti and nishta. Why? Because as soon as three quarters of your anarthas are removed, you become fixed in devotional service. You can't stay fixed unless you you remove three quarters of your anarthas. You'll be pulled again by the material energy. So fixed means I'm, I'm fixed means I'm steady. I'm steady in my service. Day to day, I keep steady service. That means fixed. I'm not deviated by whatever comes up on the horizon like that. So you can understand how much you're free from the anarthas by how much you're fixed in the service, like that. But each of the Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his Jaiva Dharma gives a very detailed explanation of each of the stages in a dialogue, it's a dialogue. So you can see what are the symptoms of each of the stages. Each stage has certain symptoms. What symptoms am I exhibiting? And that can help you. Just like when you're on the stage of Ruchi, you're always joyful. That joyfulness may take, takes the form of in, a type of inner happiness. One is at peace with themselves and always happy in every situation. They're not, if something goes wrong, they don't lament. If something doesn't come their way, they don't lament. Yeah. They don't hanker after material things. They accept whatever Krishna gives them. So, th so that stage has the characteristics of no hankering, no lamenting. So when you're like that and you're feeling happy all the time, that happiness is an internal happiness. It may express itself outwardly or may not. It doesn't, it doesn't really change. But that internal joyfulness within oneself is the stage of ruchi. That's a pretty high stage. That's the end of Vaidhi Bhakti, where Raganuga Bhakti begins like that. So we can see where we're at. And it's nice. Take a barometer and then you, then you know what, what to work on. Like Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Bonnie. Okay. Come on, we want more questions, more questions. If you ask a question, that helps and stimulate the other devotees to ask questions too. Don't ask questions what time prashadam is. That question is not allowed. <laughs> I asked that question to the TP only. That's my question. Yes. Hi, Um I was wondering if when on the, it says nishta, does that mean the same as kanishta? When people say Kanishta? Nisha, nishta is the same as? Does it mean the same thing as Kanishta? No. Kanishta no, means neophyte or new devotee. Oh, it's, it's totally Kanishta, different. Madhyamam, Uttamam are the three categories of devotees. So one, even Kanishta is just a term. And I don't know the actual translation of Kanishta. means neophyte or... Beginner, a begin means beginner. Kanishta means beginner. And nishta means steadiness. Mm -hmm. Nishta actually means steadfastness or steadiness like that. I was just wondering because I hear the, I hear the word tossed around a lot, but I, yeah, I didn't really know. Some of the Sanskrit know. words are, are very similar, mm -hmm. but they have different meanings, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mataji, in the front here, your good wife, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Chandramali Maharaj, in your um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> second sheet from yesterday that was distributed, <clears throat> um, there was mention that <clears throat> um, um, illusion, envy, anger, all of those then led to um, hunger, thirst, uh, disease, yeah. and death. Yeah. So old age. Old age. Yeah. So um, does that imply that um, 
you know, eliminating the anatas is um, <coughs> separating one from all the sufferings yeah. of the body. Yeah. When one transcends all these material, they're called waves. And they're also called whips. Something that causes one dif distress. It's like being whipped. So the terminology. So the, there's six things. I'll read them. Uh, distress, illusion, hunger, thirst, old age, and death. So these are results of the six enemies, lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy. And these six enemies come by way of these anarthas. <laughs> so it's a, it's a proliferation. But then the antidote is Harinam Sankardan. <laughs> Kirtan destroys the anarthas, destroys the enemies, destroys everything. If one takes to enthusiastic chanting and dancing, like that. So they're called here yeah, whips. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. What well, What is the proper way to? analyze where we are at like in terms of the nine sages well you have to read what are the symptoms of each of the stages so they're mentioned in nectar of devotion and they're also mentioned in throughout the books and Prabhupada mentions them just occasionally in many of his lectures but Bhakti Vinodakura really makes a science of that so Madhurya Kandambini is a really good book to see where you're at and what are those anarthas. That's the best. Harinam Chintamani is also good. Maturya. Bhakti Thakur, he's a spiritual scientist. He studied scrutinizing the process of bhakti. And he knows the symptoms on how to understand the symptoms and how to eliminate the symptoms. He's getting a lot of his information from Srila Rupa Goswami, but he's also adding his own intelligence. Like that. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur's books really go deep in this. Yeah, like that. Yes. Nityananda uh, Pran Prabhu. Good to see you. Hey, wonderful. Thank First you. of all, Maharaj, I'm very, very happy and grateful to see you. Welcome back. I'm happy to be here. You know, I had a realization this morning when I was chanting Japa. I was thinking, I feel like I never left. <laughs> I was looking around, I think, maybe I never left here. <laughs> just looking, I was just having that. Everything felt so perfect, familiar. Nice, convenient, mm -hmm. uh, kind of fit. <laughs> Everything fit in. It was just a one flash thing, so don't get any ideas. It was just, it just, it just came and went. But <laughs> so that's that was my experience. But thank you. Well, thank it's you. Really Mark. wonderful to be here. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm still a little unclear as the what is specific about Denuka Sura and Pralamba Sura that Lord Balaram kills them. Is it that these are qualities or, or bad qualities that hinder us from taking up bhakti and the others is when as the process of bhakti Krishna uh, removes them? Or? That's partially correct. They're also part of your parabdha karma. That karma that is still manifesting itself. And so, yeah, the charya say you have to make a, an extra endeavor to rid yourselves of these things with the guidance of the spiritual master. In other words, you have to take help from your spiritual master directly. You have to 
get his advice and you have to you know work towards getting rid of these whereas the other pro the other anarthas seem to fall into the category of just successful execution of bhakti but these things have a little bit of a unique aspect in that even within bhakti if we don't work on them bhakti will never develop fully like that we see even in the highest we see great great devotees they climb very high to on the spiritual platform then they get attracted by power or position i can give examples that it's right what's happening right now in our movement i don't i won't say any names but it's just there's some position some power or some attraction for that opposite sex that all of a sudden arises and there's because that has not been completely purified from their heart that attracting again starts to grow and unless they check it with what we say proper endeavor proper association it can again turn into a full-blown material desire hmm. Does that does yeah you, your 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 response was is correct yeah that element is there you have to make so usually when a person um, uh, advances in Krishna consciousness and then something like this happens like you just described other power or uh, falling to the senses etc. Generally, it is said that there was an offense previously committed that has not been addressed. Um, yeah, that's there. So, so sometimes it's not necessarily this or that. It's just that one may not be cautious or alert in one's bhakti. Um, but... Uh, Bhakti Vinod, actually Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati talks about the, what we call, what is that called, the, the, the final obstacle, Pratishta. Pratishta is the final, one gets rid of sex desire, doesn't, is not attracted to the gross form of sex anymore, but wants, still has the element of being adored or worshipped or some facility to enjoy some kind of position <clears throat> that that is what is it called the last snare of maya that's what Prabhupada calls that even great yogis they can't give that up they can't get it up the idea of being worshipped adored followers like that Pratishta is the hardest one. It's easy, not easy, but it's it's routine to give up what we say gross sex enjoyment, because one can see all the all the problems that come with that. But then again, one gives that up. But the see, Palambasura represents both the gross and the subtle. The subtle is profit, adoration, and distinction. Very difficult to get rid of. Very difficult. Extremely difficult. So one has to endeavor and not... So therefore one has to practice bhakti in such a way that one understands my position, trinata, peace, and ichena. Like that. Then one has the tools to overcome this. Mm -hmm. Because you see, Krishna likes to glorify his devotees. Krishna likes to glorify his devotees. So the devotee gets glorification because Krishna wants to glorify his devotees. But if the devotees start to think, I deserve this glorification, and then they start falling into that mentality, the wrong mentality. So even though Krishna glorifies his devotees for whatever reason, 
Devotees always have to understand it's Krishna's mercy, that's all. Or Krishna has allowed me this disposition, Krishna is empowering me to do this. One understands that nothing is coming directly from me, but it come, things are coming through me. One becomes transparent. That's why when one gets worship, one is meant to pass it on. All glories to the Vaishnavas, all glories to my spiritual master, all glories to the, to the Lord. <clears throat> but if we don't pass it on, at least in our mind, then there's this, this what we say, a type of consciousness that develops. And then you can see, you can see that consciousness when you don't get it, you feel unhappy and then you realize, oh my God, I'm like that? That person didn't respect me and I'm disturbed because of that. Then you know it's still there. <laughs> and you know it's still there. <clears throat> you can see it. So Pratishta is the hardest one to get rid of. So one has to work on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. <clears throat> um, I have a similar question than um, Nityananda Prana Prabhu on the same theme. I was just thinking in terms of dealing with lusty desires like Pralambasura represents and thinking also from Krishna's perspective in the Bhagavad Gita when he explains to Arjuna that loss is what causes uh, the living entity or the conditioned souls to act even against their wishes yeah. into something. Unwillingly. What yeah. causes a man to <clears throat> perform sinful activity even, even unwillingly. Yeah. yeah. Lust. Yeah, so <clears throat> as in the life of, you know, pursuing devotional service and um, uh, we have in, at least I can talk in my experience, you go through those upside downs in terms of dealing with your lusty desires and uh, also in the experience of helping devotees, you know, um, there are times in which the manifestation of this lost desire is so embarrassing that you don't want to uh, share it with your spiritual master. And for what, um, what is explained, what you brought out is that we need to actually uh, reveal your mind, reveal our mind to our spiritual master to be able to kill this demon. Right. If that doesn't happen, in general, we take shelter of praying to Krishna or taking shelter of the following the general instructions that are there, change your rounds attentively, etc., etc. But et sometimes that's not enough. But it's not enough. Can you tell us a little more about it? You as a yeah. spiritual master. The mind, and, uh, the mind is, is secretive. The mind has a tendency to be secret about its own contamination and doesn't think, it thinks that yeah, I know it's there, but I can get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I can do it. I don't know, really need to reveal my mind. And so that harbors that, that anartha. And you actually sometimes even make believe it's not there. And the mind just says, it's not really, it's not so important, you know. Kind of push it aside. But then it grows. So by revealing it, sometimes just by the process of revealing it to a person who is qualified, who is a person that is qualified? A person who is in a position to give you the instructions and a person you can trust. Has to be trust and that person has to be qualified, not, not just one or the other, but, but both. So when you do that, a lot of times, just like Bhakti Tirta Maharaj was, I was, I, I asked him one time, I spent a lot of time with Maharaj, and I said, how do you do it, Maharaj? You're always with devotees, and you're always trying to, you're helping devotees one after another. How do you do it? What's the secret? He said, I don't really do much, I just listen. Because they want somebody to talk to. 
And when they talk to, they reveal their heart. And all of a sudden, as they reveal their heart, they can understand what is the solution. So I'm just there to help them open up. And they, and by opening it up, a lot of times they can see their own solutions right in front of them. So a sympathetic ear, somebody who cares, when that person is there, sometimes nothing much is said, but the solution comes just by the revelation. It happens a lot. And sometimes there is some, there is some concern to come up with a solution, but a lot of times the problem is we just don't have anybody to reveal our hearts and minds to. That's why Rupa Goswami says one should confidentially reveal one's mind and also to hear confidential thoughts. That's one of the, the loving relationships between Vaishnavas. So that should be a practice. But that can't be done with anybody. It has to be done with someone who you can trust and somebody who is qualified. But everyone has to, has to do that. If you can't do it with your spiritual master for whatever reason, then you should also find a senior devotee who you can trust. Everybody has to have that. Because little things can become big things if we don't deal with them. And big things can turn into major obstacles. Yeah. Just a following, Maharaj, just to clarify. To talk, to reveal one's mind to another devotee, in this case, will, will, will have the effect of killing the demon as to speak to your spiritual master, or you have to... If, if that person is qualified, you, you, may, you have to make that judgment beforehand. Is this person qualified to hear? And is he qualified? Or is she qualified to give me the answers I need? And can I trust that person that they will not reveal that to others? That's the trust part. Yeah, so that's the process. So it's good to have a close friend in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Could even be a peer group. A pure person doesn't have to be a senior person. But you can't do it with husband and wife. It's, it's just too close and it just doesn't work. <laughs> Obviously. You have to find someone outside of that relationship to do that. If you want your marriage to be successful, you have, the men have to have friends outside, the women have to have friends outside. And that strengthens your relationships with each other. Because if, if a husband and wife depend so much on each other for everything, they cripple each other. And they make that relationship weak. So sometimes we get married and think, oh, now all my problems are solved. <laughs> How do you <laughs> both? I have nothing against marriage. <laughs> But I'm just telling you what the Acharyas tell us. That ultimately, yeah, one should have relationships outside of that so one can reveal their minds. Because a lot of times the problems come between husband and wife, and so having that outside strengthens the one's understanding of how to make my marriage even stronger or better. Like that. That's why our Krishna consciousness movement is based on Sadhu Sangha, association, friendship, the community, relationships. The more we develop relationships, the more we feel happy and also everything is there. Materially and spiritually also, not just spiritually. So that, that's an endeavor we have to make. We have to develop relationships with others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a relationship with Krishna in the form of Prashad. So, thank you very much, and please forgive my jokes. I'll try not to say too many in the next class. <laughs> All glories to Srila Prabhupada. 
All glories to the Vaishnavas. Hare Krishna. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna, everybody. Thank you, Maharaj, for an elucidating discussion on Pralambasura and Dinakasura. A couple announcements before Prasadam. Outside in the front lobby, Shanti Mataji is sitting at one table, and that is for registration. And across is Vishaka Mataji's table on the Hare Krishna movie that will be playing on Friday here in Chicago. Uh, one other thing is the parking lot behind the temple, directly connected to the temple, is parking for pujaris. If you're parked there, we have one parking lot that's fenced in by a black iron gate. On the other side of this little alleyway, you can continue following the alley.